We're excited that you have joined us for church at home this week. We hope that you and your kids have gotten ready. You're sitting there. You're watching and expecting God to do something. Even though we're not in the building, God can still move in a mighty way at your home, in your car, wherever you're watching or listening to this. God can do mighty things. With that being said, what we need you to do is, there's a couple things we need you to do. The first thing is this. If you want to give your offerings and tithes today, you can click the link below in the comment section. Um, it's restoration. It's paypal.me backscore restoration chapel. And you can be able to give online. I want to say thank you for all that have been giving. Uh, all that's been uh, uh, helping us impact our community and also impact our church through your giving. I want to say thank you so much for continuing to do that, even though we're not in the building. Also, we want you to like this, share this, so your friends can see, your friends and family members can see what is going on at Restoration Chapel, and not only what's going on at Restoration Chapel, but hopefully get a word that can change their lives. So go ahead, go down to the bottom of the screen, hit share, and share this out. Like this, let us know that you're on there by liking this, but also comment. Let us know who you're watching with, where you're watching from. If you feel like saying amen, click a, type in amen. If you say good word, type good word. If you want to repeat something that is being said, type that. If you want to tag somebody below, go ahead and do that. Like you're in the building. If you would praise God in the building, you can praise God at your home. So thank you for letting us come and join you while you're at home and while we're continuing to do this. I thank you so much for being a part of this. With that being said, this morning we're continuing our series, Cell Phone Parable. And this all started uh, a couple weeks ago. And if you want to go back and watch this on Facebook and YouTube, you can go back and watch these and get called up. But we started talking about how our cell phone is a great parable, a great story, a great example of how we are connected to God. And in week one, we talked about being connected to the power source. And we said that your cell phone can only run for a while, but when it's connected to the outlet, when it's connected to the power, it charges it up and it's able to reach its purpose and, 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 and also uh, not only the purpose that it has, but there's a lot of potential that can come out of it by being charged and hooked to the power source. Then in week two, we talked about how the plug-in that you plug into the wall, that represents the word. Because when you're hooked into the power, it has to be distributed some way. And the best way for it to be distributed is through the word of God. And so in week two and week three, we talked about the word of God through the word, the scripture. And then we also talked about the audible voice or the spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And, and how we need to get rid of all the noise and all the things that are around us and listen to God. Then last week, we started talking about the cord that connects the plug to the phone. And in that cord, there's two separate cords. And just like in our life, there's two things that is powered through the word. And that has to be our prayer life, which we talked about last week, and our worship life. You see, we talked about how last week prayer is our communication with God and how we need to be prayers and how we need to start having a lifestyle where we're in prayer with God. If we want to see things happen in our communities, if we want to see things happen in our lives, then we got to have a radical, uh, 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 prevailing prayer lifestyle. We talked about that last week, which leads us to today in worship. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 7. To a very familiar chapter in the Bible for a very familiar story in the Bible. Luke 7, starting with verse 36, that's where we're going to start at this morning. And this, and I'll give you a second to get there, but while you're getting there, I want to tell you this morning, worship has to be a lifestyle in our lives. You see, we can have the Word of God, we can have the power, we can have the be hooked to the source, we can even have a prayer life. But when we begin to have those things and we begin to understand through the word of God, then our worship life comes and it's powered through the word of God and through the source of God. So this morning in Luke 7 verse 36, and we're going to read quite a couple of verses through 50. So go ahead and follow along with us. And it says this, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to me. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. 
when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet between, behind him and began to wash his feet with tears, and, and, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had been at him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he was a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of this woman that is that touched him. For he, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pieces, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both, telling them, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house and gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them away with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou dost would not anointed, but this woman have anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. It's an awesome story. We've talked about this story many times here in this building. I preached about this story, but God brought me back to it to understand that we need to have a lifestyle of worship like this lady had. You see, this woman was worshiping God before she was even saved. She worshiped Jesus before she knew that her heart was going to be changed. And this morning I'm asking you, what kind of lifestyle are you living? Are you living a lifestyle that believes that you're worshiping and believes that you're doing things for God but not really doing them? Or are you living a lifestyle like this woman who didn't care about what people said about her, didn't care about the Pharisees that are around, didn't care about her peers that was also there. All she cared about was Jesus. You see, worship is defined as the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. The biblical word for worship means excellence of character, dignity, worth, worthless. worthless. BibleStudyTools.com puts it like this. One may always consult Webster Dictionary for the pr precise meaning of worship, adore, uh, worthy, reverence, homage. Yet truly defining worship proves more difficult because it's both an attitude and an act. John Piper said this, that worship is, the inner essence of worship is to, to know God truly and then respond from the heart to the knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God, being satisfied that God with God above all things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in, in acts of praising from the lips and in acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. You see, I love it because those last two definitions really bring it home because it tells us it's more than just an attitude. Some of us have an attitude of worship, but there's no action behind it. Some of us have an attitude of, hey, I'm holy and I love Jesus and I love God, but there's no action behind it. But God has said, and, and, and Jesus has said, and, and, and the Bible has told us that worship is more than just the attitude, but the action that goes along with it. Jesus said in John 4 and 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. You see, true worshipers worship Him not with just the attitude. They worship Him in spirit and in truth and with actions. And to, not, and to this morning, we will see what true worship looks like. You see, worship doesn't have to happen in a building. 
I've come to realize that over the last six months, that worship doesn't have to happen inside the building. Worship doesn't have to happen when a praise band comes. Worship doesn't have to happen when somebody sings a song that you love. Worship should be a part of your life. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Spirit of God. So if we say we're born again, if we say that the Spirit of God lives inside of us, if we say that we have been saved, and I want to take it a little bit further because there's a lot of people that say they've been saved, and there's a lot of people that say they've been sanctified, and there's a lot of people that have said they've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, but are they truly living a lifestyle of worship? Because worship is more than a one-time thing. Worship happens in your life daily. With our text today, I want to ask you, what does this true worship look like? What does it look like? I want to give you some characteristics of what true worship looks like. The first one is this. True worship is activated by a bold initiative. We've talked about this before here at Restoration Chapel. You see, there's something about knowing that you do not belong in the presence of Jesus that qualifies you to be there. There's something about knowing. Have you ever been somewhere, and if you have, go ahead and put this in the comments, where you felt like, hey, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not worthy of it. I'm not worthy of that position. I'm not worthy of that place. I'm not worthy of being around these people. But the thing about this is, when you feel that in the presence of God, then that under lets you understand and lets you uh, uh, feel down deep that it qualifies you to be there. You see, if you think you belong in the presence of Jesus, you most likely don't. Just look at what the Pharisees, the Pharisees invited him in. The Pharisees was with Jesus, and then they didn't invite him in for the right reasons. They invited him in so they could kind of slip up because they didn't believe who he said he really was. They thought they were doing a favor to Jesus by letting him in. There's many Christians that go in our church buildings. There's many churches that have services that, and that says, hey, I just, I, it's a favor for me to be here today. There's many times we come into the building and we serve and it says, oh, they're good to have me. Oh, yeah, they better be glad they have me. And it comes back to ourselves. But this woman didn't belong there. This woman didn't belong in the presence of God. This woman didn't belong with the Pharisees. This woman was a sinner. And everybody knew she was a sinner. Everybody knew that she was messed up. And the thing about Jesus is, Jesus even knew that she was a sinner. But this woman didn't care. Because boldly she came to Jesus and knelt down and began to wash his feet. And began to be with him. And began to worship him. And that's when it truly becomes a lifestyle of worship when you boldly step out and say listen I don't care what anybody else thinks I don't care what everybody else says I don't care about what it looks like I will worship God you see it's not a privilege for Jesus to be in my presence it's a privilege for me to come into the presence of God you see I'm not doing him a favor by reading the word of God I'm not doing him a favor by, by praying. I'm not doing him a favor by, by sitting in, in a church service. I'm not doing him a favor by paying my tithes. You know what I'm doing? I, I, he's allowing me to do those things. He's allowing me to come to the building. He's allowing me to read the word. He's allowing me to serve him. And because of that, I worship him. Some of us today... We carry a lot of guilt and shame of the sins in our lives. But I want to let you know, if your guilt has brought you to the cross, it can become one of the agents of true worshipers in your life. You see, when we come to Him broken, that's when we begin to worship. When we come to Him messed up, that's when we begin to worship. When we come to Him unworthy, that's when we begin to worship. Because we understand that our work means nothing, but His work means everything. And church, we need to get into a lifestyle of worshiping boldly at the feet 
of Jesus. We need to have a lifestyle of not only worshiping boldly in the church, but boldly at home, at our jobs, uh, at the restaurant around us. Worship God. Have love for God. Act for God. And when we begin to do that, God begins to do things. You see, this woman was bold enough to show up in a place where she did not belong. Hebrews 4 and 16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may attain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can find mercy and grace when we step boldly to the throne. I'm asking you this morning, are you bold in your worship? Are you bold in standing up for God? Are you bold by not falling under those temptations in your life? Are you bold by, by peer, uh, not falling for peer pressure that comes along every single day? Are you bold? Which leads us to the second point. We've talked about this before too. But I want to bring it to you this morning because I believe it's a time that we need to understand that. Not only do we need to come boldly, but we I need to understand that worship is demonstrated with a costly sacrifice. costly sacrifice. Do you realize that when we worship God, we need to sacrifice something to Him. We have to get rid of some things. We see it all through the Bible. The disciples gave up their jobs. Such as fishing, such as being doctors, such as being tax collectors to follow Jesus. Job gave up his family, his wealth, and his health to follow Jesus. David gave up his heart to follow Jesus. The three Hebrew children gave up their, their lives to follow Jesus. And Jesus gave his life to follow God. You see, you have to make a costly sacrifice to truly worship God in spirit and in truth. You have to truly make a sacrifice. That means you don't worry about what people think because you don't care about your reputation. You care about the glory of God. That means you go out of your way sometimes. And sometimes you have to spend some time uh, witnessing even though you feel like you have other things to do. But you do it because you worship in God. That means taking the time out to come to church even when you don't feel like it because you're worshiping God. And that means giving sacrifice back to God so he understands that listen I know how great you are I understand that you I'm more satisfied with you than anything else and because of that I give you everything true worship comes with a sacrifice this woman took a box of ointment that would equal the year's wages and poured it at the feet of Jesus. But that's not all she did. She also took her reputation of being a sinner and went to a place where sinners were condemned just so she could worship. She also stepped out of line and, and began to anoint and kiss the feet of Jesus when everybody else said, no, don't touch, don't do that, be quiet, be reverent, be this way. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how, how the uh, Bartimaeus began to yell, and even everybody's telling him to be quiet, hush up. This woman said, listen, I know i got to worship this man called Jesus, so even if the world tells me that I'm wrong, I'm going to go to him and sacrificially give everything to him. True worship gives costly sacrifice. In fact, the greatest worshiper that Israel ever had was King David. In 1 Chronicles 21 and 24 says this, And King David said, Oh, I may, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for thy Lord, nor offer a burnt offering without a, without a cost. You see, I see people worshiping, and they'll raise their hand, but not really worship. I see people worship and they'll give a dollar when it's not really a sacrifice. I'll see people worship when they're around other Christians and around other people, but not when they're around those that don't know Jesus. That's not truly a sacrifice. It's 
leads us to the third thing, and that's this. True worship comes from a grateful heart. True worship comes from a grateful heart. When Jesus said in the text, who is forgiven much is loved much. He is not saying the worst are the better you will worship. But instead, it is the ones that are fully aware of the depth and the scope of that forgiveness will truly worship Him. You see, those that have a grateful heart will begin to worship God. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to a lot of people through traveling stories, through phone calls, through things that I've never thought before. And guess what the common thing is? Is that we get familiar with God. We have too many Christians that are familiar with God. And you've forgotten the grateful things that He's done in your life. And just because you're not going in a valley right now, you don't understand that He's in control. But church, if we will have a grateful heart to God, we will begin to worship God sacrificially, boldly. We will begin to come to Him and understand how great He is. Do you have a grateful heart this morning? Do you understand that Ephesians 2 and 1 says, and you have been quickened, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Do you understand that he's brought you out of that? Because when you understand that, you have a grateful heart. You have a grateful heart. Church, I'm asking you, If we connect to the source and we're getting into the Word and we're praying prevailing prayers, we need to stand up and worship God like He's called us to do. Are you aware this morning, the one that you're worshiping? Are you aware that He did what He has done? Are you aware that He's still in control? Do you have a bold initiative that says it doesn't matter who's around, what's going on, if nobody else will worship, I'm going to worship? Do you still have that mindset that says, hey, even I, I'm not letting the rocks cry out, I will cry out if nobody else does? Do you have that bold initiative in your life? But not only that, will you give sacrificially to Him? Will you get rid of some things for Him? Will you take the time for Him? I was talking to a pastor, Jonathan Fowler. He's a youth pastor. And he said when he, when he talks to people after they get saved, there's two things that he always tells them. Now you have to give your time and your money to God. What he meant was this. If you can't give sacrificially to God, then have you really been changed? Because when you start giving sacrificially and you start having a bold initiative to come to Him, guess what happens? You have a grateful heart for what He's already done. This morning I'm asking you, are you living a lifestyle of worship? Where it's more than an attitude. But are you showing with your actions? If not, here's your chance. This morning I'm asking you, we're going to pray a prevailing prayer this morning. That those that are watching this will not only connect to the source, but will also start having a lifestyle of worship. Let's go to prayer. God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for this time together. I thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do, Lord. Lord, I pray for each one that is watching this this morning. God, I thank you for allowing us to come into their living rooms, their bedrooms, wherever they're watching this at. And God, I thank you for planting this seed that we need to come boldly to you with a sacrificial cost to you, God. And also, have a grateful heart. I pray that our worship changes this morning. That it's not about a song, not about a time in church, but it's all about you, God. Lord, I pray if there's one that doesn't know you and doesn't have a relationship with you and is not connected to the source that you come into their lives and you connect them. Lord, we thank you for this day. 
thank you for this time together. And we give you praise and worship and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say, Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. I want to tell you, please check out our Facebook page, our Instagram page, so we can continue to get updates coming out. We'll have an update about next week, hopefully by Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. So you can go ahead and make plans to either be with us here in the building or at home. But we want to thank you so much. Please continue to remember the families that have been affected by this virus. But not only that, let's remember Brother Doug as he finally uh, went home to be with the Lord. I say that like that because he was ready. And as his family and friends here on this earth, we're going to miss him. But I can tell you right now, he's raising a hallelujah there in heaven, right beside Jesus. And I want to thank you for all those that have prayed, that have reached out to the family, that have given food, given cards, everything that you've done, text messages. Thank you so much. This family needs us more now than they ever had before. And we need to step up and be the body that God's called us to be. I want to thank you again for watching this. Thank you for all that you're doing and all that you continue to do. And I'm asking you this morning to connect to the source, get in your word, and begin to pray prevailing prayers, and begin to worship God. Thank you for being with us.